We've seen the three seed slot challenge and the two seed slot challenge, but have you ever wondered if it's possible to beat Plants vs Zombies 2 with just one seed slot? Yeah, me neither, but we're gonna try it anyway. This is the Plants vs Zombies 2 one seed slot challenge. Quickly before we get started, here's the rules. I can only use one plant in each level, so yes, the whole run will be dependent on sun falling from the sky. This also means in conveyor belt levels I can only use one of the given plants. I won't be using any power-ups. I can only use plants unlocked for the adventure mode, this means no gemiums, no premiums, and no cediums. I'm going to be playing through the game as it is in the current version as of recording, the 9.9.2 version. This will be important later. Despite only being allowed one seed slot, I can make use of plants that are pre-planted on a lawn since technically I didn't place the plants from my seed bank. For example, the Save Our Seeds plants are allowed. And finally, all of my plants will be level 1, just like the good old days. I say this because someone has actually made some videos where they played the game with only one seed slot, but... With all of these rules, this challenge is going to be insane. We start our journey in the tutorial. Unfortunately, you can't skip it anymore for some reason, so here's a quick time lapse of me sweeping with just Pea Shooter. Oh yeah, and in this one I beat the whole level with Potato Mines. And now we arrive at Ancient Egypt, this is where things get serious. Day 1 was more Pea Shooter spam. Day 2 is literally a level showing off power-ups, so I think I'm excused here. I spiced things up in Day 3 with some cabbage pult action. Luckily, there were two pre-planted sunflowers, so sun production wasn't an issue. Next was the level showcasing Bloomerang. This was our first conveyor belt level. I obviously chose Bloomerang as my plant and dug up any walnuts that I placed from the conveyor belt. That was a real shame. Seriously though, the conveyor belt levels get very, very chaotic later on. Between levels I was forced to upgrade my pea shooter. This is the only plan I'm allowed to have at level 2 because, well, Penny held me hostage until I pressed the upgrade button. Day 5 was Bloomerang again. I unlocked Iceberg Lettuce, which I will never use since it can't kill zombies. Now I was forced to buy a piñata and... Popcap, fix your game. Our first real challenge came with Day 6, the first Gargantua level. I first tried to beat the level with Cabbage Pult, and that went bad to say the least. After a couple of attempts with Bloomerang, I managed to win. Barely. Day 7 was a locked and loaded level. They made a mistake by giving me Bloomerang. Tomb Raisers started appearing in Day 8, so I made use of Cabbage Pult's lobbing attacks to shoot over the gravestones. Day 9 and 10 were just more Bloomerang spam. In Day 11, I completely forgot what this whole video was about. <laughs> In day 12, I had a hard time with the sarcophagus zombies. I solved this by saving my plant food for them. Day 13 took a couple of tries because of the mold colony, but it was more bloomerang spam. Also, take a look at this bloomerang plant food. How did it survive? Because of the sheer amount of gravestones in day 14, I used cabbage pulp. Day 15 was a save our seeds level, but it was considerably easier than other levels because the three endangered plants were sunflowers, granting me a stable source of sun production. Day 16 was more bloomerang spam, and the level really highlighted how much of an issue that any zombie stronger than a conehead causes in this challenge. I needed to sacrifice my lawnmowers for the bucket heads. The next two days were both more bloomerang spam. I used cabbage pull in day 19, well, because I felt like it. And then we unlocked a repeater. Now it was time for Ancient Egypt Day 25, our first Zomboss battle. I walked into this level thinking it would be impossible. I chose to use Repeater as it was the most consistent plant in terms of damage. The only issue was, well, gravestones. So many gravestones. Zomboss spawned so many Tomb Raiders at the start of the level. After doing a little bit of damage to Zomboss, he starts sending an absurd amount of bucket heads that my very limited supply of repeaters couldn't keep up with. This was the first roadblock of the challenge. But after about an hour of failed attempts, I noticed something critical. When the level starts, Zomboss spawns only about one or two zombies per summon. One of these zombies is guaranteed to have a plant food. This meant I could possibly abuse the early game to farm plant food. 
The only problem was, as soon as zombies took a little bit of damage, he would start spawning the hordes of bucket heads that I mentioned earlier. So, what was the solution? Surprisingly, the frustrating amount of graves actually proved to be useful. You see, by planting my repeaters behind the gravestones, the gravestones would tank the damage from the peas, rather than allowing them to hit the zomboss and trigger his buckethead spawning. His initial spawns were only coneheads, basics, and tomb raisers. And as I mentioned before, they always included plant food. So the Tomb Raisers could create gravestones to tank for Zomboss to keep him in his early stage, while the weak basics and coneheads would walk past the graves and get killed by the repeaters to farm their plant food. On top of all of this, the stalling allowed me to build up my repeaters in the early game. I guess slow and steady really does win the race. And win the race I did using this strategy. Albeit with some lucky charges by Zomboss. Day 1 was just repeater spam. We unlocked Kernel Pult, which will be quite useful for this run since it's a relatively cheap offensive plant with stalling capabilities. Day 2 displayed Kernel Pult's potential in this way. Potentially the easiest level so far, Day 3, was one of the Coconut Cannon minigame levels. I remember when these used to be great for farming coins, and now... Not so much. In Day 4 I used Repeater to deal with the bucket heads. The lawnmowers carried me hard in Day 5, and they carried again in Day 6. Do you expect some kernel pulse to deal with all these hordes? No, you don't. And that's the beauty of this challenge, and how we've somehow made it this far. Day 7 was more professional kernel pulting, and we received the note for the boss battle. The real reason this made me nervous wasn't because of the gargantuas, but because the next level was a conveyor belt level. As we've discovered, and we'll discover multiple times later, conveyor belt levels are the most dangerous levels in this challenge. Day 8 was no exception. These are the plants that the conveyor belt gives you. Of these, the only viable option to defeat the massive hordes of zombies and gargantuas is the Snapdragon. As you can see, the Snapdragon has a maximum limit of 6, so this level has to be beaten with just 6 Snapdragons on the lawn. Yes, it was as hard as it sounds. Regardless, I was consistently making it to the last quarter of the level. Surprisingly, it wasn't the barrel rollers or bucket heads causing the issues, as I just saved my plant food for them. It was actually the weak seagull zombies. Whilst the seagull zombie has a pretty bad toughness, its speed is what was allowing it to shred through my snapdragons. The level throws consistent waves of seagulls spread across all lanes. The seagulls in the middle three lanes were killed by the snapdragons. However, the seagulls on the outer lanes wouldn't take as much damage, due to the lower number of splashing snapdragons in front of them. The speed of the seagulls allowed them to, over time, take valuable bites from the snapdragons on the outer lanes until they whittled away and broke through to the house. So, how did I solve this issue? Well, I couldn't. After hours of attempts, I gave up. So the challenge is over? We lost? Not quite. As you may know, the current version of Plants vs Zombies 2, as I'm recording this video, features a bit of a glitch. I could simply skip to Wild West by going to the Almanac and pressing the View on Map button on the Split P, so we could continue the challenge. I don't count this as cheating because, well, it's not. This is a feature in the game, not an intended feature, but a feature nonetheless. It's not like I hacked the game, I just used a real part of the game that PopCap stuffed up on. So, on to the Wild West. Day 1 really showed how useful the minecarts in this world are for this challenge because of the, well, obvious lack of plants. Apart from that, it was just repeater spam. Due to the prospector zombie, Split P was required for Day 2. Day 3 was Colonel Pool. Lots of Colonel Pool. Day 4 is where we hit another roadblock, Not OK Corral. Yeah, this is impossible. The start of the level requires us to plant a pea shooter, so we have no choice but to use pea shooter as our only plant for the level. The only problem is, the conveyor belt only gives two pea shooters before switching up the plants. Again, the challenge isn't over. By skipping the frostbite caves, we can continue the run using the almanac glitch. In day 4 we use Repeater, nothing new. An obvious threat this world poses is a frozen wind, which will decimate my plants unless I use fire plants like Snapdragon. So I used Snapdragon for day 2 which handled the cold really well. Unfortunately though, this is where our journey in this world ends. Day 3 is insane. There's just so many zombies since this level was designed for you to use Hurricane. In fact, I doubt this level would even be possible without Hurricane, let alone with just one plant. For day 1 we used Repeater. I think you can see the pattern here. At this point I realised the abundance of gold tiles in this world will be helpful for the challenge, acting as sun producers. 
day two introduced Red Stinger, which will be quite useful for the run since it's a basically cheaper repeater. Also, I never thought I'd say this, but its role changing gimmick, depending on where it's placed in the lawn, will actually be handy since it acts as multiple plants in one, which works around the one seed slot limit. By picking Red Stinger, I basically have a Walnut and a Repeater, as well as a weird combination of both, depending on where I place it in the lawn. Day 3 was actually more challenging than I thought. Since level basically only gives Lava Globbers, I thought it would be easy. But what I didn't consider is that the Red Stingers actually pick off the basic zombies in Coneheads, allowing you to save your Lava Globbers for the bulkier Bucketheads. So I have to waste my Lava Globbers on weak, basic zombies, putting a lot more pressure onto my Lava Globber supplies. After a few tries, we managed to succeed. Thanks to Conveyor Belt RNG giving a Lava Guava at the last second. Colonel Pulk came in clutch in Day 4, yet again. Day 5 was pretty straightforward. Trust me, it was so tempting to use Cherry Bombs. Day 6 was just more of the same. However, Day 7 was a different story. This is where the infamous combo of Excavator Zombie and Parasol Zombie appears. As you can imagine, our plant options are very limited because of this. Plants like Repeater are useless because of the Excavator Zombie, and plants like Colonel Pult are useless because of the Parasol Zombie. I decided to use Snapdragon, as it's one of our only plants that can damage both of these zombies. Unless I want to use Split Pea to attack the Shovel Zombie from behind, which is just, uh... After a couple of tries, we managed to prevail with Snapdragon. Day 8 was just a straight up soft lock. It's a locked and loaded level with both the Shovel and Parasol Zombies again, and these are the given plants. Yeah, it's, it's just not possible. Hopefully we can get further in the far future. Day 1 was simple with a repeater, yet again. I realise the power tiles gimmick will likely be helpful for this run due to the lack of plants. Day 2 introduced Laser Bean, a plant that I have very conflicting opinions on. While it's good at dealing with large groups of zombies, it just fires too slowly to deal with more tanky zombies. And trust me, there's a lot of them in this world. Colonel Pult strikes back. Yay, we unlocked Blover. We're never gonna use it. Sun Bombs appeared in Day 4, which is very nice because it was one of the first times in this run that we actually had stable sun production. I've always liked these levels, they're very fun. Day 5 took a few tries because of the tanky Robocone zombies which were hard to deal with due to the limited sun, but we prevailed, making use of power tiles and repeaters. Laser Bean plant food ability absolutely sweeps Day 6 and Day 7. And now we arrive at the Gargantua level of this world, and it's not possible. What were you expecting at this point? The conveyor belt provides a vast array of plants and it's impossible to keep up with the zombies when you're only placing like one laser beam per minute. Once again, we use the view on map trick to progress to the Dark Ages. So, Dark Ages. The world that's infamous for giving no sun from the sky. So, how did I beat day one? Well, I didn't. We start off with 75 starting sun. The level has many sun gravestones so we could use them to get sun, but none of my plants were 75 sun or lower that could attack tombstones. We'll certainly come back to this one later, but for now it's time for Neon Mixtape Tour. Day 1 showed off the punk jam in this world, which is very annoying. Usually in a normal playthrough, the punk jam's speed boost to the zombies isn't too noticeable. However, in this challenge where everything has to be extremely precise, it's actually really overwhelming. In fact, until recently, I didn't even know the punk jam sped up zombies. Well, now I know too well. Day 2 was pretty similar. Day 3 was a conveyor belt level. Luckily, the conveyor belt was consistently giving cacti. Also, I don't know if anyone's noticed this, but Cactus's shadow is off-center. Kinda weird. Day 4 took numerous tries with Colonel Pulp. My strategy was basically just stalling the zombies with butter until the final wave so I could let the lawnmowers do all the hard work. Day 5 wasn't impossible, just very, very hard. The punk jam was, again, super annoying here because the zombies were easily able to shred through the endangered plants. At first I tried using Colonel Pult, and... That went well. Then I tried Bonk Choy, and... That also went well. And Snapdragon. Just to add insult to injury, Penny decided to offer me a tip after losing many times to use plants that I don't even have and wouldn't be able to use anyway because I only have one seed slot. Thanks, Penny. Finally, I tried Red Stinger and it ended up working. After many, many tries, I developed a strategy. This involved letting the zombies eat the endangered walnuts until they were like one bite away from dying, planting Red Stingers at the exact time the punk zombies kicked the walnuts to the fifth column, and planting a Red Stinger after the lawnmower went off in the middle lane early enough so that it can kill the zombies hiding behind a conehead, but not too late that the conehead isn't killed and gets to the house. <gasps> yeah. 
This was very, very precise. One of the more difficult levels of the run so far. Nevertheless, we prevailed. We unlocked Celery Stalker, which may be useful for the run due to its high DPS and low sun cost. In day six, the zombies took the... Day seven was a different story. There's simply too much zombies for the Celery Stalkers to handle. This one's probably impossible. But as you'd surely know by now, the run isn't over. Yet again, using the Almanac glitch, the next stop is Jurassic Marsh. Day 1 was quite simple with Primal Pea Shooter. This is a plant we'll definitely be making use of due to its high damage and ability to stall zombies, buying us precious time. Day 2 introduced the Raptors, but Primal Pea handled them well. The infamous conveyor belt made its return in Day 3, but luckily it was generous, allowing us to beat the whole level with just Grape Shot. Day 4 was another Primal Pea sweep, and Day 5, and Day 6. Day 7 wasn't that hard. Well, it wouldn't have been that hard if it weren't for the flowers. I only managed to make it about halfway through the level before the sheer number of zombies was too overwhelming for the primal pea shooters to keep off of the flowers. Sadly, just like Neon Mixtape Tour, we only managed to make it to Day 7. Next up we have... Primal pea shooters usefulness carried over to this world. Day 1 and 2 were handled very well by Primal Pea Shooter Spam. Day 3 included our old friend the Conveyor Belt. The level was fine though because, well, this level was designed before the Chomper buff. Day 4 was more Primal Pea. Day 5 was a Conveyor Belt level, and you know what that means? It's impossible. We're given Pea Shooter and Tangle Kelp. This poses a problem. The zombies are too strong to be dealt with by just Pea Shooter on its own, but there are too many zombies for Tangle Kelp. Even so, the zombies walk out of the water too quickly anyway. I'm actually happy with how far we've progressed into these last few worlds, considering they're the hardest in the game. Now all that's left is Modern Day. This is my last chance to redeem myself. Can we beat Modern Day to prove that Plants vs Zombies 2 is possible with just one seed slot? Let's see. Modern Day Day 1. I did not expect the first level to be so hard. I tried for hours to beat this level with Primal P. But the Tomb Raider zombies that constantly spawned from the Ancient Egypt portal would always fill my lawn up with tombstones, rendering my Primal P shooters useless. I was about to give up before I tried Colonel Pult, and... Yep, first try. Day 2 featured these guys. They are the bane of my existence. On top of this, there's just so many zombies in this level. This run has made me truly appreciate how chaotic modern day is. I doubt this level is possible with the plants we have so far. This is where the run unfortunately ends. So is Plants vs Zombies 2 possible with only one seed slot? No. I have to say though, the amount of levels we managed to beat including the whole of Ancient Egypt is unprecedented, considering how everyone blows up about the difficulty of this game. But, that's not the end of this challenge. Now our question changes to how many levels in Plants vs Zombies 2 are possible with just one seed slot. And that's going to be my next video. So make sure you hit the subscribe button and turn post notifications on so you don't miss it. It's going to be big.